Good morning. Welcome to Wednesdays with Willa. I am your host, Willa White, and this is my weekly podcast show that airs on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. So you can like and share and follow and get all of these great shows. You can look back at the archive videos and get notice about my other events that I'm doing. This also airs on blogtalkradio.com slash lilydale radio. That's an audio only version, uh, but you're welcome to tune in in that way as well. And I'm so excited every week because I get to talk about different spiritual topics. A lot of times I'll have a, a guest on the show and we'll have a spiritual conversation um, relating to either spiritualism, mediumship, healing, faith, family, and more. And I do the occasional show where I fly solo. And I have a, a special topic that's been close to my heart for quite some time that I really wanted to share with all of you today. And the topic today is Helen Keller's religion. So I'm going to explore that a little bit for, for all of us today. And I hope that you get as excited about it as I do, learning about the history and, and of course, learning about spirituality. It's such a wonderful opportunity to do those things. Before I get started, I want to mention that there are other Blog Talk Radio shows that you could go on to, as I said, blogtalkradio.com slash lilydaleradio. I, I know we have our four shows that we've been running for the last few years, and now there's an additional I think four or five more shows. So go through, you can find all the, 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 day, the days of the week and times and, and different show hosts, because I'm still getting news about those things. And I also wanted to mention, I have my upcoming classes starting next week. I have month two of Mindful Mondays, and you're welcome to join in on Mindful Mondays if, you, if you'd like to. It's a four-week class series, and we've already done the first month. You can also uh, get access to the videos, so you can catch up if you'd like, or just join us for month two as you wish. But it's a focus on energetics and intuition. It's been going so well that I want to make sure that I, I run it at least another month. I'm also offering other classes. In, in fact, June 2nd, I'll be offering spirit guides. So if you, we've always wanted to know how to connect with spirit guides, it's going to be a great class for you. We're going to go through the different uh, members of the, of the band, as it were, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to experience connection with your own spirit guide. So I'm really excited to offer that class and there'll be more and I get I do post those on my Facebook page. So I want to get into today's topic, which is Helen Keller's religion. So most people know who Helen Keller is. She's a, a very famous figure from American history, although she is has international renown. Uh, she is uh, a person who really overcame quite a lot of struggle. Uh, she was deaf and blind. And it's a very unique story that I, I'm glad got, got told through the years. She was born in 1880 and about a year and a half into uh, her life here on the earth plane, she had an illness that caused her to be deaf and blind going forward. And she uh, very much did not know how to handle it and neither did her family. They, they did seek out the help of, of doctors and in her, in her particular case. And I do feel that they, they tried very much to do what they could for their daughter. There were other children in the family as well. And up until the age of seven, she didn't have a, a sense of language. Uh, they had a few ways that she could convey what she wanted, but nothing um, like, you know, speaking the way you and I are and the formulation of, of those things. I think um, when, by the time she was age of seven, she maybe had 60, they say, uh, 60 ways of connecting and letting people know what she wanted and that she wanted it quite now. <laughs> uh, so eventually they, they happened upon uh, Ann Sullivan, because Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, was very supportive of the deaf and wanting to make sure that they had resources and services and that people started to understand how to work with them. Um, and it's so beautiful that Ann Sullivan, who had gone to a special school herself because of vision issues, 
I believe she was around the age of 20 when, when um, she was given the opportunity to be the governess to this very special child, Helen Keller. And things initially didn't go well. You've probably seen the, um, the Miracle Worker. It is a, a movie that is based on Helen Keller's life. And it was because Helen Keller wrote the book, her autobiography, The Story of My Life. And it really started to put that into the forefront of people's minds of the struggles that she had been through and, and the miracle of being able to overcome so much of her struggle. So I really like to highlight people who have had that amazing experience of having to, to dig deep within them. And she does credit her teacher with quite a, a lot in terms of guiding her and giving her for the first time a way of expressing herself and relating with people in a higher way. So I want to focus on some of her spiritual experiences and what led her to have a deeply uh, strong connection with her soul and God because I find it very inspiring and I hope you, that you do too. And uh, a lot of what I'm, I'm going to use today came from a book that she wrote called My Religion. And you can see that I have tabbed <laughs> with post-it notes different pages that I found very interesting. And I'm not going to read the whole book to you, but I'm going to feature a few things from it just so you, that you can enjoy it and uh, get a sense of it yourself. She re wrote this book in response to people asking her time and time again about her religion and about her spiritual understandings. I think people really found her to be a fascinating person, especially because she was the first deaf and blind person to receive a bachelor's degree of the arts. And she went to Radcliffe College and you know she did other um, studies at universities. But people really were just like, how could she do it? And when you read her book, she is an eloquent writer. And she went on to be quite an amazing public speaker, which I, I find even in that journey, not only did she uh, have to learn to uh, read using the braille and, and um, uh, sign in order to speak with people, but eventually she did overcome severe speech impediment. I mean, think about it. When you're a year and a half old, there's a lot that you haven't formulated at that point verbally. And she was able to, you know, focus her energy and her intention to overcome so that she could be the one to verbalize her thoughts and to share them with people. So I'm going to tear up here, but I just, I just think it's uh, amazing um, because so many people would probably have given up or had people give up on them. But uh, Ann Sullivan didn't give up on her. Uh, she really knew innately what she was doing, I guess, to, to bring this uh, about. But she talks about in her book having had an experience and she was sitting, let me see if I can find it. She was sitting on uh, with her, her teacher and she was just all of a sudden transported elsewhere. And it was fascinating to her that she had this experience where she knows that she went to Athens and that she, well, you know, whether it was astral travel or remote viewing, she had this experience of connecting on that higher level. And that is something that happens to uh, us in, in meditation or to intuitives or mediums that are connecting in with information. There are many times that we're taken, taken to a spot and be able to uh, experience it. And it really changed her concepts of things. And the reason she so desperately wanted to understand religion more is because what she was being told at the time seemed very harsh and you have to remember that there was a lot of fire and brimstone uh, at that time in Christianity. And she didn't like that aspect. And she really was seeking a more loving understanding of God. And what really came into her hands uh, through an association through the Alexander Graham Bell um, 
there's a gentleman named John Hines, H-I-N-Z. And he, I believe, was originally from Switzerland, but he uh, met her, and he's an old, elderly, elderly gentleman who really saw an, a, an amazing energy and spirit in her and took the time to try to communicate. And so when she was 13, they started to have discussions um, about spiritual matters. And even for six weeks in the summer, he would come and visit with her and her teacher and they would have wonderful walks in the morning. And he would tell her what was around her and the trees and, and then describe things to her. And he himself had difficulty hearing so she does talk about the fact that she had to keep repeating things sometimes six times in order because um, she, she was learning how to enunciate herself. So the challenges of communication, <laughs> right? But she talks about how he, he was um, an instrumental part of her understanding about spirituality. And... He, she first met him in 1893 when she was 13, and he really was one of the few who fully appreciated her teacher, Anne Sullivan, and, and the peculiar significance of her work, not only to me, but to all of the world. And he, they would write letters back and forth, and he learned Braille, and he he actually had things translated into Braille for her. And the first book, it's my understanding that the first book he had translated for her was the title Heaven and Hell, written by Emmanuel Swedenborg. Now, why is that significant? This was to change her understanding of spirituality forevermore, to have in her hands a book by Emmanuel Swedenborg Emanuel Swedenborg, so I've, I've got to go take us a little bit into the world of Emanuel Swedenborg, is an amazing figure from history who was a scientist, uh, a philosopher, and I will in, in a future show really highlight him, but I wanted to give you an entree into Emanuel uh, uh, Swedenborg through the eyes of Helen Keller because uh, she really eloquently puts together in her book, My, My Religion, uh, why he was such a, an amazing force. So way back in um, 1688, uh, Manuel Swedenborg was born in Sweden. And he was born to a Lutheran family. And he, from the ages of, I believe, four and 10, did have spiritual experiences, connected and talked to angels. But his, uh, in his, he would go on walks with his father in nature and really connect very deeply in that regard. And so he was raised with a religious sense, but also that understanding of the natural world that I find uh, really crucial in the development of a person. I've noticed this. A connection with the natural world really does assist in soul growth, soul development. So... With, with all of this, I guess his mother is the one who said, you need to stop talking to angels. That's just absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> you need to stop. And so he, he, he put that aside um, at the age of 10, that, such a tender age, right? And he really focused on his studies. And from what I can understand, he himself had a speech impediment, so he had to speak very uh, slowly and concisely in order to get his points across and he he came across as a very serious person very you know you know the cast of his face but he when people talk about what he was like way back when they say he was a very handsome young man brilliant young man he went to to uh, university and he really wowed the people there and I think that it's really fascinating because he was had a mathematical mind, a scientific bent, um, in, and it really uh, was something that eventually led him to be able to scientifically uh, and intuitively explore the realms of spirit and angels. 
So his childhood was really a beautiful childhood overall, and he really had a, a close affinity uh, with many of the great minds. Now he grew up in a fire and brimstone time. It, you know, mid the medieval feudalism was just starting to really break apart apart uh, while he he was coming onto the earth plane, and he was part of this understanding of it had to be a certain way. So he, he graduated with honors from everything. His father wanted him to go into the diplomatic service and he chose in instead the path of science. And he would go and he would go visit and speak and have conversations. So through conversations with uh, great minds, you can bring other things to light. And I think that's what's so important about this interaction and conversation that we have with other people, that other things are brought to light the more we open ourselves to true conversation. He was a man who, was, uh, who studied every department of science, an independent thinker, powerful and original genius discoverer. He was familiar with the forge, the quarry, all the workshop, the chipyard, the songs, the stars, uh, everything uh, having to do with nature. He had an amazing mechanical skill. In fact, he drew plans for uh, a flying carriage, which would be known as an airplane. He drew uh, things for the air, the submarines. He, he had all kinds of machines for condensing and exhausting air by means of water. Uh, the, the king of, Swe of Sweden said, you need to come and work for me. And he put him in charge for decades, uh, in charge of, of things having to do with uh, mining operations. He devised an air gun capable of discharging a thousand bullets a minute. He had plans for drawbridges, all kinds of things. He studied paleontology, biology. He outlined atomic theory and nebular hypothesis years in advance. Of La Pla, La Place, and he was really a amazing force to be reckoned with. People, the crown heads of Europe, really looked to him for his um, his intellect and his uh, ability to problem solve. Uh, beautiful, beautiful things, and the people who have studied Swedenborg uh, have really enjoyed what he brought to the table uh, scientifically. But what started to happen is he wanted to explore more and more the spiritual understanding of things. He even was uh, in the process of writing a book about what the soul was composed of. He was trying to understand what materials comprise the soul. So he he really was a forerunner runner of many of these things. And Ella, Albert Hubbard said that um, he wrote that Swedenborg wrote something called Animal Kingdom, which was a book that really brought in the, the soul and the idea of um, the forerunner to Darwin's theories of evolution. But he saw in a tiny lichen on a rock, the beginning of a forest. And so a lot of his ideas were then translated for other people. He was a prolific writer. This man wrote all kinds of books having to do with mathematics, mechanics, and mining, uh, knowledge of chemistry. I mean, honestly, this man was very, very, very impressive. So he moved into the world of spirit when he was about uh, 55, 56, it's debated. Uh, he started to have independent conversations with angels. And because he was uh, uniquely gifted with this incredible mind of the inventor and the scientist, he, he really knew how to ask the right questions <laughs> and to go deeper into the analysis of these things. And he, he wrote, uh, for 30 years, I have examined and re-examined the phase of my development in light of new theories. I know I am impelled like an animal to seek food and warmth. I remember all of those things, but I know that there is an infinite mind. And so he started to translate the Bible into uh, symbolic meanings, and that is still used today. Uh, you see that in New Thought writing, that, uh, that understanding of symbolic 
understanding of the the Bible that really helps it to be a living word for people. And he wanted this to be something that was not just a, a cold uh, religion for people. He wanted it to be something that was welcoming because that's what he felt in his conversations with angels. And so he wrote extensively. In fact, he, he wrote 18 theological works and many of them were unpublished and later found because uh, at the time people would only seek him out on the scientific matters. And he eventually uh, did pass at the age of 84. And it wasn't until years later that a lot of his understandings came to light. And Helen Keller, 150 years later, after he wrote a lot of these books, uh, was given, you know, Heaven and Hell by Mr. John Hintz. And so now she wrote My Religion in, uh, in uh, 1926, I believe. So we're about almost a hundred years after Helen Keller wrote this book. So just to kind of give you a framework of history, 250 years ago is, is when Swedenborg would have, uh, have written a lot of these books. And people do consider the fact that if you haven't read Emanuel Swedenborg, you will not understand 19th century theology. Uh, because there's a lot that came out of it. And I do believe very strongly that spiritualism, in the sense of modern spiritualism, really was helped along by Swedenborg, his connections with spirit himself. Andrew Jackson Davis eventually felt the guidance very strongly of Swedenborg in his mediumship and in his connection with spiritual world. So throughout uh, time after Emanuel Swedenborg was on the earth plane, people have felt connection with him and they have felt him to be an inspiration and spiritual resource. And I think it's incredible that it made it into the hands of Helen Keller. So with all of this, this deep, uh, after his scientific period, he really was able to bring to light this unique personality. And what was so important for, um, I wanna go back here real quickly. What was so important for Helen Keller is because initially she ha was just, uh, she recognizes when she looks back as a child in those times before Ann Sullivan, how she was angry and that she really could only make signs for things that she wanted to eat. She might be able to find some eggs in the farmyard, but really she was, she, these are Helen, Helen Keller's words. I was like an unconscious clod of earth. Then suddenly I knew not how or where or when my brain felt the impact of another mind. And I awoke to language, to knowledge, to love, to the usual concepts of nature, of good and evil. I was actually lifted from nothingness to human life. Two planes as irreconcilable as Swedenborg's earth experience and his contacts with a realm beyond the cognizance of our physical senses. So, you know, by having Anne Sullivan come into her life to give her language, to have that spiritual conversation and move her into being a clod of earth, as she describes it, into that realm, that is what I find so um, people are really seeking. They don't want to just be a clod of earth. They don't want to just be of, of this mundane um, understanding. They want to move beyond that. So this, this is a, a universal concept that Helen Keller was feeling during those times. And Swedenborg really was instrumental in her going into that understanding of the infinite mind. And that's how it is. We learn and we grow and then we're given more information and we learn and grow. And then through the generations, hopefully things become better. Uh, things become uh, that, that we do better as, as souls as we progress and genera generationally. And so many of the great minds, Walt Whitman, Red Swedenborg, uh, Henry James, Emerson, uh, a lot of uh, people who understood about spiritual matters uh, really understood that it was important to have that 
divine concept, be present in the life. And you can see that in their work. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was amazing and um, in, in everything that he explored, uh, the things before the ancients and moving in into spiritual concepts. It's important to study the things that have gone before so that we can understand how God has been with us that entire time. So I want to take us back to, uh, to Helen Keller and after she after reading Heaven and Hell, I expressed a wish to know more of Swedenborg's writings, and Mr. John Hintz laboriously compiled books of explanations and extracts in order to facilitate Helen Keller's reading. So we, Helen Keller understands that her, under, her religion, her spiritual nature, was so cultivated um, by Mr. John Hintz. It's not that he force-fed her these things, that he gave them as an opportunity. And I think that because of her interest, he, he kept feeding her and allowing her to cultivate those that mind. When you read My Religion, you really see that this is a woman who understood not just the grammar basics, but there are very difficult words in here. <laughs> And you, you, you go, my goodness, this is a woman who was deaf and blind and didn't know how to speak initially. And the, the eloquence that is on these pages are not just a mimicry of what she has read through Braille and in discussions she's had with other people. This is something that was, it uh, became such a... a a part of her very being to understand visions and insights. And I, again, I need to go back because she talks about it several times of, of wanting to understand, you know, Christianity and wanting to understand connection with God and that she wanted to be able to not just see God as someone that um, was wrathful, that she wanted to see where night is lit to eternal day by the smile of God. I glowed through and through as I sat in that atmosphere of the soul and watched men and women of nobler mold pass in majestic progression. And that is something that was so important. That's why, what I feel when I read books too. And she says, I was glad to discover, this is because of what Swedenborg wrote, I was glad to discover that the city of God was not a stupid affair of glass streets and sapphire walls, but a systematic treasury of wise, helpful thoughts and noble influences. Gradually, I came to see that I could use the Bible, which had so baffled me, as an instrument for digging out precious truths, just as I could use my hindered, halting body for the high behests of my spirit. And that is something that really helped her throughout the difficulties and struggles of her, her life. She said, each day comes to me with both hands full of possibilities. And in its brief course, I discern all the verities and realities of my existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the spirit of beauty. Uh, you can see that she understands the poetic soul very strongly. And I, I think it's so beautiful the, what she's able to express. I've already talked about Henry James. People did compare him with Shakespeare, uh, the Swedenborg that is, and uh, really saw that if you could appreciate what he was giving, um, that it would really help in terms of understanding genius and how man's acts are part of a higher purpose. So you talk uh, extensively about those things. I got to flip to my next post-it note here. Um, I, because I, I love this part. We, Helen Keller, this is something that, this is the woman who had so many limitations and was able to overcome them somehow. She writes, we need limitations and temptations to open our inner selves dispel our ignorance, tear off disguises, throw down old idols, and destroy false standards. Only by such rude awakenings can we be led to dwell in a place where we are less cramped, less hindered by the ever-insistent external. 
Now, this is a woman who was in, by and large, cut off from the external world a lot of her life, uh, not seeing uh, light. She went into that state of internal, internal light, the divine light that is within us. And so often when we meditate, that closing of the eyes, so we are able to see better. Uh, many times that actually takes away the distraction of the external world. I'm not saying everybody needs to be blind, but in that sense of uh, amplifying the inner senses so that you're not just cut up, caught up in the external is, is really essential. Now, uh, she does talk about, my life is so complicated by a triple handicap of blindness, deafness, and imperfect speech that I cannot do the simplest thing without thought and effort to rationalize my experience. experiences. If I employed this mystic sense constantly without trying to understand the outside world, my progress would be checked and everything would fall about me in, con in chaos. What she's saying is, we, we have to have those moments of going inside, of connecting with the divine. But if we want to, to really fully live, we also have to embrace the external. And that's why she felt so important. It was so important to connect with other people, to not just stay encased in her deafness, in her blindness, and uh, in not being able to verbalize. So how often in your life, perhaps, have you felt that you have not seen? or not heard, or not spoken the way that you would want to. And she said, it was easy for me, it is easy for me to mix up dreams and reality, the spiritual and the physical, which I have not properly visualized. And without the inner sense, I could not keep them apart. So even if I commit errors in forming concepts of color, sound, light, and intangible phenomenon, she's talking about spirit communication and, and connection with God, I must always try to preserve equilibrium between my outer and my inner life. Neither can I use my sense of touch without regard to the experience of others and respect for it. So there, even though she is deaf and blind, she understands that it is something that's not just unique to her, that we all as individuals need to have the inner and the outer life and do our best to rec reconcile and balance between the two. Because it really wasn't until later in life that she learned to speak. And it's something that I'm sure to be able to express her own thoughts and not just have them translated by someone uh, in her sign language. It was something that she really um, wanted to be able to convey. And... I'm glad that she was able to move out of her disappointments about religion and embrace something that made sense to her. And I find it so fascinating that it, it really was part of the beginnings of modern spiritualism and uh, with uh, Emanuel Swedenborg. So there was a gentleman who had asked her to write this book, especially because he really felt that it was important that she convey that because uh, Swedenborg's philosophies and teachings and his understanding of religion did become a church. It's known as the as the new church and through uh, out uh, the world there are, are different spaces that are what you could, would call Swedenborgian churches. So uh, I, to date I don't know of any in the, in the United States but it's quite possible and the more people start to understand their spiritual uh, life, the more they'll research uh, how other people receive visions and spiritual insights. But their whole uh, religious community energy associated with Swedenborg. But there was a man, and I, I need to make sure he gets mentioned, because he wrote the foreword to her book. And his name is um, Paul Sperry, and he was from Washington, D.C., which is you know where she ended up meeting, I believe, uh, John Hines and I think that Alexander Graham Bell was was there as well. There were a lot of people that she was in and out of, of Washington D.C. with, but she then he asked her to write an article, and uh, the article is Dr. Helen Keller's introduction to the true Christian religion, and she write wrote extensively 
uh, not just the My Religion book, but she divides it into her understandings of the Swedenborg religion. And there are three main ideas to Swedenborg's uh, theological teachings. If you're, we're going to sum them up into three main ideas. You've got have God as divine love, God as divine wisdom, and God as power for use. Kind of interesting, right? And so those are uh, really important ideas that Swedenborg brought to light. And if you've been to Lilydale, you know that uh, Lilydale is considered the city of light. Well, well, that actually came from Swedenborg. So uh, we have a city of light spiritualist church, but Lilydale, if you look at the gate and everything, um, it used to be called the city of light at one point too. So uh, on, a, on a legal level, <laughs> it used to be called before it came around to Lilydale. But he, he talks about the city of light, God's city of light, and Swedenborg had walked through its sunlit, way, sunlit ways of truth. And that's also where we get the term Summerland, is from Swedenborg. And he wrote a book called Divine Love and Wisdom and talks about how there, there was this fountain of life. And he, if you read through Swedenborg's books, and I've got a whole stack that I'm, ma I'm making my way through. <laughs> Wish me luck. <laughs> but I, I really want to understand it more. Um, I have read some uh, Manuel Swedenborg in the past, but I really wanted to refresh uh, and, and really kind of uh, swim deeply in the waters of his philosophy and see what comes out of that. But... Um, he really saw that most human minds had in them that secret chamber. And I find this really interesting from Helen Keller's article that she wrote. Most human minds are so constituted that there is in them a secret chamber where theological subjects are stored and their center is the idea of God. If the idea is false and cruel, all things which follow it by logical sequence partake of these qualities. For the highest is also the inmost, and it is the very essence of every belief and thought and institution derived from it. I hope you understand the importance of that, that the highest thought that you have in, the, in that secret chamber is, is where, how you will shed light on the rest of, you, of your world and the understandings you bring to your world. This essence, like a soul, forms into an image of itself everything it enters. So this, this essence that we bring to our relationships and to the world is derived from that soul. And those beliefs that we set up so can be um, almost like lies or, fi or fictions that we tell ourselves. And that it's important that the idea of God as a spirit is not just an idea, but is that deeper understanding of divine love and divine wisdom. And I, I do feel that in Helen Keller's understandings of Swedenborg, he, you know, when he saw that, that Swedenborg, uh, uh, that uh, Jesus uh, that God, God in the person in, of the essence, he viewed God as one being. So this is something that made his philosophies not so uh, accepted because he did not believe in a trilogy uh, of the, tri I'm sorry, the trinity uh, of things. And so people were not necessarily happy with uh, Swedenborg's um, putting forth that it's all one and that we shouldn't split it up into the Trinity. Uh, he absolutely felt a uh, connection with Jesus uh, and with God and that there is truth at the center of Christian doctrine, but he did uh, want a, a lot of dogma attached to it. And that's something as spiritualists that we do talk in terms of not wanting those kinds of dogmas attached to it per se. So I, I want to let you know that that's, so, that's something that spiritualism has in common with un, the spirit, Swedenborgian um, understandings and theologies. So 
uh, one of the things that, that uh, Swedenborg said is that God is omnipotent because he has all power from himself and all other power, all others have power from him. And so as spiritualists one in our Church of the Living Spirit, which is my home church, I refer to it as my home church, and uh, we believe in God is the first principle. We believe that God is all there is. And that's something that Swedenborg also understood. And he did mediumship. In fact, uh, he did mediumship for the Queen of Sweden. Uh, a family member close to her had passed and she said, all right, tell me something that only he and I would know. So Swedenborg went up to the Queen and whispered in her ear and she said, oh, that is something only he and I would know. And so Swedenborg was a medium. <laughs> so this religion, uh, the, uh, the spiritual understanding that Helen Keller had is based on someone who is a medium. And I don't think people under, understood uh, that in terms of Helen Keller and, and, uh, um, and where that was stemming from. She obviously uh, embraced those understandings herself. I would be interested to know whether anyone knows out there uh, if Helen Keller had attended any uh, mediumship services. I would be really interested. I, I, I haven't found anything myself at this point about any readings she had with mediums. Um, I haven't found that yet, but I'm, I'm open to finding out more historical information and, and how her life may have been woven in with spiritualism uh, and Lily Dale. And, and eventually, in terms of, of her passing, she, she, actually, she got a, a nice long life. She died at the age of 87. She had had some strokes leading up, up to that. And I, I kind of wish there was something that was um, written about that end of life for her, if who might have been present around those last days. But I know from what I've read that she had requested her funeral service be presided over by um, a person from the Swedenborg church. And her brother, who did not uh, believe along those lines, said, absolutely not, we're not going to have someone who uh, is is of that ilk do, do it. But she was uh, cremated and then her ashes were uh, taken to, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the cemetery name now. So, uh, oh, I know, here it is. The National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And her ashes were, were placed next to her, her constant companions, Ann Sullivan and Polly Thompson. Polly Thompson actually was uh, someone who had helped Ann Sullivan um, at the end of her life, too. So it was something that uh, they did honor her wishes to be together with them but they did not honor her, her wishes to have a Swedenborg uh, church um, funeral service. So if that doesn't just underline for you what her beliefs were and what importance that was to her in, in terms of uh, throughout her life, the more she discovered. And so uh, I also want to make sure I mention, I've got a few night, um, oh, I will, like I said, I will cover more about Swedenborg in a, in a future show, but just to let you know a few more things, he did predict the Stockholm fire of 1759. He was 250 miles away when all of a sudden, he was at a dinner party, I think it was like six o'clock at night, and he was like, oh, there's a fire. And in back in those days, 1759, there were, it's not as instant as an email or picking up a phone or anything like that. So it was then verified three days later, I believe, that he was absolutely correct. And one of the reasons why um, Swedenborg felt so strongly that he needed to not just live from that scientific mind, but to go into intuition he, he considered higher knowledge is not something that can be acquired, but that it is based on intuition. Wow. Um, this is a man who had studied everything he could from, 
from um, stem to stern, you know, like top to bottom. This is a man who, when all was said and done in terms of science versus intuition, he chose intuition every day of the week, especially uh, in those later years when he was writing and understanding that that was the resource for his entire life. Higher knowledge is not something that can be acquired, but that is based on intuition. And he did, in fact, predict his own death. He had a, an, a friend who said, well, I'll see you in, in six months. And he said, well, I won't be here. I'm going to die on March 29th. And wouldn't you know, Emanuel Swedenborg died on March 29th. So he predicted his own death. This is a man, the reason he was able to predict his own death is that the angels had told him. He, the angels had told him. Fascinating man. Fascinating man. I encourage all of you to look more into Emmanuel Swedenborg yourself or wait until I cover it if you wish. But um, Helen Keller's book, on My Religion, is really beautifully written. Um, I do I do recommend recommend it because I think it's great to know how uh, you can connect on those levels. She doesn't detail how to do it yourself. It's not a do-it-yourself book at all. It's very much her own story and that understanding of Swedenborg that she came to. So I'm glad that I could share all of this with you today. I know that's probably a lot of information to throw at all of you, but I wanted to kind of, you know, give you an opp opportunity to really see her uh, as a woman of faith, because I don't know that that uh, has been covered well. Um, and I wanted to make sure that it was brought to light, especially because it it's so in line with our own beliefs as spiritualists, our own experiences as mediums and healer healers and our um, connections with the light. And here is someone who was in the dark, who saw the light. So thank you everyone for your kind attention today uh, about Helen Keller's religion. I hope that it really um, cemented in you that you can move forward yourself. And even if you feel one day that you're just a clod of earth, <laughs> like Helen Keller did, that you uh, will embrace that you are more than that. And that there is a, a higher way and that there are higher beings that you can tap into and that you can learn more about yourself and the soul. Uh, there are classes, there are books, there's just your own sitting with your soul and connecting with nature and the vibrations of the world. So God bless all of you and I'll see you next week on Wednesday's Willa at 10 a.m. And many prayers and love to everybody. Bye-bye.